The NFL draft is not easy to predict. Things always happen to surprise and shock us, and this year obviously was no different. Today, I'm going to talk about the most shocking and surprising picks from day two, rounds two and three of the 2024 NFL draft. Let's get into it. We'll start with the Falcons taking Ruka Rororo, interior defensive lineman from Clemson at number 35. Not only did they take Rook Arororo at 35, they traded up to get him, trading one of their third round picks. That's how highly they thought of Rook Arororo. And I can see why, because the potential is good. He was one of the best run defenders in this class. And I'm not really, I guess, including nose tackles in that group. We'll talk about one here in a little bit. But Rook has great athleticism and, again, is great against the run. It was just... Not somebody I expected to see go ahead of Johnny Newton. Very different players, no question, but I would not have guessed that Rook was going to be a top 35 pick. And not only that, the Falcons traded a third round pick to get him to move up a few spots. So just something that caught me off guard. And what caught me really off guard was Tavondre Sweat going at number 38 overall to the Titans. I'm a big Tavondre Sweat guy. He is a nose tackle. He is a monster. Now, at times at Texas, he was able to slide across the defensive line. He wasn't always just playing over the center on the nose. He wasn't playing zero or one. Sometimes he would move over and play three tech. But he's going to be an NFL nose tackle. He is a people eater. He's going to clog up space, hold blocks, and he is a pretty good athlete for someone that's 360 plus pounds. He can push the pocket and, again, is tremendous against the run. Won the Outland Award. Of course, I'm a big Longhorn fan. I love Tavondre Sweat. He had such an incredible 2023 season and was a big, big reason why Texas was able to be as successful as they were in 2023. However, DWI, weeks before the draft, has a history of kind of being like that party guy, that class clown guy, as they say, and he wasn't someone that really seemed to take football all that seriously before 2023. He said he was going to make a change, make a commitment to getting better on and off the field, and he did that, and he had a dominant 2023. And then the DWI happens, and you're like, all right, what's going on with this guy? Especially, not that there's ever a good time to have that, but especially weeks before the NFL draft, I heard he was going to go on day three now. I asked around, people said probably somewhere, Round four, maybe even pushing into the fifth. It's just a tough guy to take a chance on. He's just a nose tackle, and he's someone with character concerns, to be honest. And he's shown up overweight uh, at the Senior Bowl. You know, you, ideally you want him playing around maybe 350 as opposed to 365. But the Titans clearly, you know, brought him in for an interview right after the, D- the DWI happened. He apparently was very honest, explained everything. And the Titans felt comfortable about him enough to take him at 38. I love the player, obviously. He is a stud, but I I thought he was going to go maybe 100 picks after this. I mean, I, I could not believe when I heard Tavondre Sweat's name get called. And in terms of being just a great player in this class, I get him inside the top 50. But I heard he was going to go day day three, round four, something in that range. And it's just... I was I was really surprised when he was the pick at 38. And I was really surprised when Johnny Newton made it to 36. I thought there was a chance he could sneak into the second round, but then when another defensive tackle got taken over him in Ruka Roro from Clemson, and again, different players, but I was just really surprising. Johnny Newton's a really great player, tremendous pass rusher, a Jones fracture in his foot, maybe pushes him down the board a little bit. Pro Day wasn't at 100%. That's why he's available at this spot. And then a team that does not need interior defensive line took him with Deron Payne, with Jonathan Allen. Yes, it's important to have a rotation of guys on the defensive line. And I don't hate it. They're got Gary, they're getting a really, really good player in Johnny Newton. This was just not the fit I saw happening. I thought maybe the Falcons were moving up for him. Nope. Commanders stick and pick, get Johnny Newton. It's a great pickup. I promise this list is not exclusively defensive tackles, but... Uh, For the time being, we're talking about defensive tackles. And Braden Fisk was the pick here for the Rams. Why was this so shocking? Well, not only did the Rams take Braden Fisk at 39, there was a big run on defensive tackles, as you can see. Rook at 35, Jerzon Newton at 36, Devondre Sweat at 38. The Rams are like, all right, we got to make a move. But why was it so crazy? Why was it so shocking? The Rams gave up a second round pick next year. Unbelievable. A second round pick plus a pick swap to go up and get Braden Fisk. 
And Fisk kind of profiles to play the role that Kobe Turner would play. So I don't know that he's going to be someone that that moves over and finds success at five tech. He's just classic three technique. And it's going to be interesting to see if he's going to find success and where with the Rams, because you'd expect, especially going up to get him at 39, that the Rams expect to play him and Kobe Turner on the field simultaneously. But I like the player. It's just uh, at 39 and moving a second round pick next year in what profiles to be a loaded class to get him. And it's bad at quarterback. It, it, or, it, we know we're going to see guys that rise up the board, but the edge class is way better. The cornerback class is way better. The receiver class is always going to be good. Probably not as good as this one. Tight end group, way better. Tackle class, probably not going to be quite as good. Running back already way better. I mean, Ohio State has two guys that could be better than any of these guys in this class. I have to see what ends up happening there. But defensive tackle, way better. Linebacker, probably going to be better. Safety, way better. Like, And I know, well, we always say the next class is better. No, we don't. No, we don't. Maybe for certain position groups, but this class in 2024 is not especially deep. Overall, it's not. A lot of positions are really, really thin. Deep a tackle, or at least very top-heavy, because we had so many great ones that went really high. Receiver as well. But in terms of overall depth, and you've heard them talk about it on NFL Network, maybe ESPN as well, like, teams have maybe 50, 60 guys that they, you know, really view as good players in this class. The rest, role players, you know, pick your poison, whatever flavor type of player you want to fit in a particular system, but they're not overall studs. Next year should be like more like a regular draft class. So this is a weird year. It absolutely is. And the Rams said it. And nobody was trading future picks, by the way, for the most part. The Rams traded a second round pick next year with this run of defensive tackles to go up and get Braden Fisk. It was just, I, I couldn't believe they were willing to give up a second round pick in order to do that. If you look at the trade value chart, the cost of 39 or the associated value was like 1300 uh, points and a second next year plus their second this year overall was like 2300 total it's like a complete fleece by the Panthers moving out of this pick but if Braden Fisk ends up being a great player we're not even talking about it like it's bad value but we'll see if he can become that some Drew Sample vibes with this one Tip Ryman from Illinois was the pick here for the Cardinals they took a blocking tight end to 82 I like Tip Ryman I do I thought he was going to be good value down the board to a team you know, looking to really improve in jumbo sets and bring out a really good blocker, goal line type tight end. Uh, of course, you already have Trey McBride. That doesn't really matter. You're drafting Tip Ryman not to be tight end one, but for tight end two, three, blocking tight end. And I was surprised to see that happen at 82. I thought Theo Johnson would go ahead of Tip Ryman. I obviously thought Jatavion Sanders would go ahead of Tip Ryman. I thought there were going to be a number of tight ends that came off the board before Ryman. Ryman not only goes ahead of all those guys, none of those guys even go on day two. Ryman, day two, 82 overall. I was, uh, yeah, not ready for this pick. And I was also surprised when the Cowboys took Maris LaFau out of Notre Dame. I thought he was a similar type player to J.D. Bertrand, and I might have even valued J.D. a little bit higher. And I look at the Cowboys, and of course, we know they need running back. That's a need for them. How do teams value running back? Not as much as they used to, obviously. But for Lufau, I'm like, you drafted DeMarvion Overshone last year. When I, I think about the skill set of Maris Lufau, I'm looking at like a spot dropper, someone that maybe can, uh, you know, play the spy role like DeMarvion Overshone I thought was drafted to do. So if you like him, you know, go get him, sure. But it just kind of felt like, why are you drafting Lufau when you drafted DeMarvion Overshone to do the same role last year? Is it already over with him? You have Damone Clark, who I like. Of course, you can never really have enough linebackers. You know, two good ones is never going to be enough. And Overshone, of course, rookie last year. But also you have Marquise Bell, who's been playing linebacker, who kind of feels like he has a similar skill set to what you'd want Maris LaFau to be doing. I just, I, special teams, and then you're doing that at 87. Uh, it was interesting. And we'll end things with Luke McCaffrey, the 100th pick in the draft. And I like Luke McCaffrey. I think Luke McCaffrey could end up being a good player. But I was just, with all these great receivers on the board, Surprised that Luke McCaffrey went ahead of those guys. Like, of course, got to talk about Oregon receiver Troy Franklin. I thought he was definitely going to go ahead of Luke McCaffrey. And I, I get why people are down on Troy Franklin, myself included. I don't see a polished route runner. I don't see someone that tracks the ball well for 
who was supposed to be a deep threat, and he got away with it at Oregon because he just ran by everybody. But I don't know that you're going to be able to do that as much in the NFL, especially with the emphasis on two high safeties where teams just completely take away the deep ball uh, and they're willing to give you things underneath. I, you know, Troy Franklin maybe is a specialization that is becoming less valuable nowadays. So he falls a little bit, but I thought he'd be a top 100 pick. I didn't know that Luke McCaffrey would be. So it was just, I like McCaffrey. I thought he was going to be good value to someone, maybe fourth or fifth round. I don't think it's a super big reach or anything, but just in a stacked receiver class, if you told me Luke McCaffrey was going to go ahead of not only Troy Franklin, but Malik Washington, ahead of Brandon Rice, who got some hype, ahead of Tez Walker, ahead of Javon Baker, ahead of so many talented receivers. Not that he's not one. It was just, I thought all of those guys would go ahead of Luke McCaffrey. Didn't end up happening. He's a good player, and I'm excited to see what he can do with the Commanders, even though I hate that team. I think Luke McCaffrey could end up being, you know, a pretty nice player. But that was certainly a shocking pick just because of the other receivers available and kind of the consensus big board. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. But that is the video. The most shocking and surprising picks of the 2024 NFL Draft for day two. And let's get ready for day three. I'll be live on Twitch. Maybe as you watch this, twitch.tv slash bangle for at least some of day three. Make sure to stop by. Link is down in the description. Take it easy.